nació al recuerdo de tu magia una tarde plena de nostalgia en el fondo de mi corazón. Under the beautiful cloud-laden skies of Central America lies Guatemala City, home of over 100,000 inhabitants and center of the wealth, culture, and political administration of the Republic of Guatemala. Until comparatively recent times, this picturesque and interesting little metropolis, situated upon a gigantic plateau almost a mile above the level of the sea, was practically inaccessible to travelers. But today, thanks to modern steamship service and the advent of railroads, Guatemala City is conveniently approached, and as a result, it is rapidly creating a conspicuous place for itself among the capital cities of the Western Hemisphere. In the days when the church and the clergy dominated Guatemala, many magnificent religious buildings were built. But since the church has been separated from the state, much of its property has been confiscated. And what remains is more or less subservient to a non-sectarian government, which has utilized many of the former church buildings for municipal purposes. The history of Guatemala takes us back to the days of the old Spanish explorers, when all of the present-day Central American republics were merely provinces of Mexico under the dominion of Spain. Juan Alvarado, a henchman of Cortes, the conqueror of Mexico, headed a military expedition into Guatemala. Like most of his kind, Alvarado carried a sword in one hand and a cross in the other, and the native Indians who dared to resist him had their choice of either living by the cross or dying by the sword. But when we look upon scenes like this, where once nothing but jungle thrived, it somewhat condones the faults of the old Spanish conquerors, who with all their alleged cruelty and bloodshed, brought to the lands that they conquered a sense of artistry and beauty that is certainly a praiseworthy tribute to their memory. Guatemala City boasts of having one of the finest and most modern hotels in Central America. Patios like this play a most important part in the construction of the better class residences, for they provide a haven of rest from the noise and the dust of the streets. El Patio typifies the tastes of old Spain, but just beyond its flower-strewn walls, the primitive traffic of old Guatemala goes on, just as it did for centuries before the coming of the white man. The Indian still prefers his own legs as the safest and surest means of travel, and the weight of his burden seldom varies, for he believes that any depreciation in the maximum load is a sign of weakness. Consequently, on his homeward journey, he often carries stones to make up for whatever he unloads in the marketplace. Due to the presence of active volcanoes, innumerable hot springs are found in various parts of the country, and the native Indian women still take a practical advantage of this natural phenomenon. Unlike the Indians of North America, relegated to reservations and stymied by the encroachments of the white man, these Indians are independent and free to pursue their lives in comparative peace. They may share in the benefits of white civilization if they choose, and not a few of them have shared their blood with the white man, so that today, a large number of the inhabitants of Guatemala are called Ladinos, which is the name for those of mixed blood. There are over a million pure-blooded Indians living in the Republic of Guatemala today, and their mode of life has been changed but little by the influences of civilization. Antigua, the ancient capital of Guatemala, was formerly one of the most imposing cities of the New World, with splendid palaces and more than 60 impressive church buildings. It was destroyed twice by earthquakes, but this church resisted the catastrophe on both occasions. Designed by architects imported from Spain almost two centuries ago, it remains to this day as one of the finest examples of ecclesiastical architecture in the New World. And now we come to the living and more vital story of Guatemala, 
A story that begins and ends with the cultivation of coffee, the most important commodity of the country. The Valley of Antigua is particularly well suited for the cultivation of this valuable plant, which is usually planted under shade trees to protect it from the heat of the sun, as well as the intensity of the wind and the rain. The forest-like plantations that are devoted to the growing of coffee are called fincas. Coffee flourishes best in latitudes up to about 5,000 feet, and this fact, added to a suitable climate, accounts largely for Guatemala's success in growing coffee that ranks with the finest in the world. The plant was first brought to Guatemala by a Spanish priest who obtained the seed from Arabia. When the coffee berries are ready for picking, the whole countryside is enlivened with activity. Most of the coffee pickers are Indians, who are as much a part of the coffee finca as the trees from which they pluck the precious red berries. The owner of a finca practically owns the Indians who work for him, for he is responsible for their medical care and their living throughout the entire year. After the berries are picked, their red skin is washed off by a depulping process, and the coffee, a greenish gray in color, is thrown upon the cement-covered yards to dry in the sun. The brown color by which coffee is generally known comes after it is roasted. The whole financial status of Guatemala is more or less determined by the success or failure of its coffee crop, for about four-fifths of its revenue comes from the coffee industry. Nothing in Guatemala is more entertaining than the dancing of the native Indians, who have adopted the marimba as their most popular musical instrument. indefinitely without changing its movement, symbolizing, as it were, the life of the Indians of Guatemala, who for centuries have kept to the even tenor of their ways, as indifferent to the changes of civilization as the beautiful natural environment in which they prefer to live. Colorful Guatemala, land of natural beauty, tradition, and romance, here on the shores of one of its picturesque lakes, within the shadow of one of its most alluring volcanoes, we reluctantly say farewell. Siempre lo mejor, tú y separa mí, eres bailo.